Well, very nice. Uh, I wanted to finish out this episode today um, with a rant that I came up with myself. So this, if this reflects poorly on anyone, it should only reflect poorly on me. Uh, but after after uh, the workout, you know, I was just uh, in the backyard uh, huffing and puffing, you know, after my 20 odd minutes of, of flailing around. Uh, I... I, I recorded a voice memo to myself and I, I listened back to it later. I'm like, you know what? That's, that's pretty good. I, I, I kind of wanted to explore this and, and figure out, you know, what, at least what, what your take is on this uh, and, and flesh it out for my own self. So the, the title of, of this grab bag is uh, all programmers aspire to put themselves in the position of Linus Torvalds. Why is that? You know what? First of all, we all know who Linus Torvalds is, and if you don't, he's the uh, creator of the Linux kernel, and, and, and still really the uh, the, well, and the Git. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Well, and Git. well, I'll, I'll get there. But most <laughs> okay. notable for uh, creating yeah. and maintaining the Linux kernel, he does actually say that Git is his most proud accomplishment. But we're we're, we're not going there um, okay. yet. We will actually. Uh, that's that's actually point number three. But point number one is, you know, to, to the fact of, you know, why do all programmers aspire to put themselves in the position of Linus Torvalds, right? Is that he's an established presence in a large project, right? Uh, and, you know, what, is, what does that mean? What, what, what are the benefits to being an established presence in a large project? First of all, we can take a look at, you know, what being in a large project means, right? Um, it means that you're established in the marketplace, right? You don't have this kind of uh, fear or uncertainty towards the future, right? You kind of know that this project is chugging along. It's, it's the same kind of sense of comfort that a lot of people get from having a job at a company. That's why a lot of people don't do startups because it's scary, right? You're taking a huge risk and you don't know if it's going to work. Uh, so, so being in a large project, especially an open source project, means that you, you know, you you know that you're moving something in some sort of a right direction, and that's not going to completely fall out under your feet overnight. All right, so you got that kind of stability. Uh, the next is you have established norms. So, like any other big company, you have an established culture. You know, kind of the the lingo or, or at least there is a lingo. Like it's not something that's trying to uh, develop itself. It's not, you know, trying out different systems of communication. Uh, it's, it's not figuring out how projects are prioritized, right? There's, there's a kind of norm to it where you, you know, what's expected of you. And once again, that's a huge comfort to someone who's coming in and saying, I really don't want to take a whole lot of risk on. And a large project will give me that opportunity to step in and there are going to be guide rails for me, right? I don't have to dive in here without any kind of support system. So those those established norms uh, can actually be a huge comfort to a lot of people. Um, and then lastly, uh, a having... Having a large project means that you're not scrambling all the time. You're not pulling, you know, 16 hour days trying to get something off the ground, right? There is a, a understanding, you know, and we touched on this in the beginning, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of human aspect, uh, in, in the picture of any kind of business or any kind of project, right? And that's, that's where projects that get this big do not get this big without understanding that. Um, and, and having a really good work-life balance. I mean, Linus himself, you know, I, I even linked here. He, he says, you know, I'm not a programmer anymore, right? He's, he's gotten to the point where he is reviewing and, uh, looking at, at, at change requests and seeing if it, if it makes sense, you know, and, and he knows code like the back of his hand. So he can tell you if something's good or bad just by kind of glancing over it. But that's Linus. He's, He's somewhere, he's something that you would aspire to put yourself in the position of. Um, so having that work-life balance is, is going to be a part of any kind of large project, right? But, but using Linus as a, as a segue here, he is also an established presence in that large project, right? So he's not some newcomer right. to a large project. He, he's been there. He, he literally created it. So since the beginning, but there's a lot of people who have been in that project for a long, long time as well. And what are the benefits to them? Right. One is, you know, the project just inside and out, right? And there's a, 
there's a really good feeling when when you know uh you know something how something should be architected just because you know the project so everything well. of it you yeah. know you know what the logic workflow is you know how data is supposed to flow through it you know you you have a good grasp on what it is you're building right and and coming from that being established in the market you know what is expected of that product right and and the constraints that you're operating under right so where something may be a good decision for a smaller uh, project, you know, for for this kind of a bigger project, maybe you want to approach it a different type of way because of the constraints that you work under, right? So knowing that project inside and out is definitely a sense of release, or, and and it gives you a a good foundation, right? To to work off of, right? You're also able, and I love this one, being able to reference documented decisions, right? So like, there's always going to be that young whippersnapper who comes up and says, you know, I've got a great idea. Uh, and, and it's just a terrible idea. Just, just the worst, right? Being able to point back to a previous discussion where all of the implications were already hashed out and agreed to by all the participants and a determination reached is a lot easier than having that conversation once every year or two, right? It, it, it saves a lot of time. You're able to go back and say, Hey, you know what? Look, there's definitely some, uh, advantages to what you're proposing here. However, we've gone through, made that deliberation, and and we just decided that's not for us, right? Like, thanks, thanks for the input. I, I definitely value it, and and here's kind of where we we went. Or you know, if someone's asking you why is this the way it is, you you go back, you know, you reference that 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 decision making process, or even better yet, the documentation that you know exactly where to point people because you know the project inside out, right? Um, better yet, the comments in your code, because we all comment our code, don't we? Right. Of course. Of, of course, course. Of course. Um, and then uh, the the last kind of thing, which which really only applies to people who are lifers, you know, you would call them in a project. But, you know, you're a guy from you're the guy from that project. Right. Linus is the guy who wrote the Linux kernel. Right. Um, Greg K.H., is the guy who's the protege of Linus, right? And and you know, there's there's all the other different types of people who are in these big open source projects who are big names, right? Um, whether they're the project lead or or just the the face of the project, right? They can can put a part of their identity in that project. They can say, hey, you know what? I I kind of am the guy from that project. Um, you know, uh, Wimpy, who led the Ubuntu pro uh, podcast, you know, for like 15 years, right? I mean, he was established voice in the community, and and I, I probably forevermore he will be known as the Ubuntu guy, right? Because totally. he has been a part of that for just so long. Um, so having having that kind of security, uh, being an established presence in a large project. Um, is is a great place to be, right? And it's something a lot of open source developers are working towards, right? And and there are very good reasons I think why they are they're working towards that. And you can kind of see where people are trying to do that. You know, even if they're young are upstart developers, right? They kind of are are developing this with a a uh, vision towards becoming an established uh, presence in the market and established presence in that large project that is in that market. Um, now, what's even better than that, you ask? Well, being the BDFL of that project, right? Because, you know, as uh, Mel Brooks says, you know, it's good to be the king, you know? So <laughs> for those of you who don't know, BDFL stands for Benevolent Dictator for Life. Uh, and this is the... Uh, name that's given to a lot of people who have uh, a, a, a big project, but they're the ultimate decision maker. You know that there's not like been a committee established. You know they're they're kind of uh, where the buck ends. You know or, or where the buck stops. Right? They 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 are the one who has the final say in, in what goes on. Um, that means they're also responsible for coordinating team efforts, getting releases out, making sure that security, you know, they're, they are literally where the buck stops. And, and I like to think of it as flipping the CEO aspect on its head because it's a leader who doesn't necessarily um, set, set policy, you know, but it's, it's that leader that is down in the mud 
and doing the things that enables everyone else, empowers everyone else, if we're using the same words today, empowers everyone else to do the work that they need to do. Uh, and and that, that BDFL is a very respected position because they're the ones who have that vision for the project. They're the ones who have uh, the the idea set and they're the ones who are going to be down, you know, get their hands deep and doing all the stuff that, you know, isn't the shiny, oh, a contributor can just jump in and do this little thing real quick. Right. right? They're the ones who are who are doing that maintenance, that thankless maintenance day in and day out. And and they earn that title and that title is used with much respect. So why do you want to be a BDFL, right? Well, you get that respect, right? Uh, you get, you know, the the legacy of being the BDFL. I mean, you're you're not only uh, a guy from that project; you are literally the guy from that project. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, perks and and different opportunities, right? Uh, being the face of something, you know, gives you a lot of opportunities to. Uh, to have doors open to you that wouldn't otherwise, right? You you are the head of a community, right? You do have uh, influence and pull and, and persuasion, right? And you can use that. Uh, you can you can use that when you're talking at conferences. You can use that while you're taking a stance on what you think the ethical way uh, that something should be maintained or, or used or, or, you know, something should be left alone. Um, your word carries a lot of weight, right? And you can not throw your weight around, but, but you can definitely have more influence than not, uh, especially if that project is, is sufficiently large. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of competition in that space. So the minute that starts getting abused, I mean, you have to really be careful because that's that's not right. going to be in your best interest, right? It, you, you're, you're always going to be stuck with this pull between, you know, am I, am I, uh, am I at the top of this hierarchy because I'm competent or am I at the top of this hierarchy because I'm abusing my power? Right. And you have to wield power intelligently. Right. Responsibly. Uh, Responsibly. Yeah. Because if you're the large project lead, I mean, you're the one who has to say, guys, this is not cool. Like we shouldn't brigade this other project, right? We shouldn't disparage other people in the community, right? You need to use your, you know, power for good because with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, we, we've all grown up with that one. Uh, and, and then at the other side, you also have to be competent, right? You can't lose your competency. You can't stop contributing. You know, the, the minute you stop contributing, you, you know, you become an armchair quarterback and, and no one likes that. And, and you get ousted really quick. Um, and then hopefully you can find some way to kind of turn that into to, to monetary gain, right? You can you can monetize that somehow, and and that's up to you, right? And and that will kind of feed back into what your legacy is, and and how you uh, are perceived to have wielded your power. Um, a couple more things about uh, BDFLs to to talk about here. Uh, I mentioned Greg Kh as Linus's right hand man. Uh, and, and Linus does have a huge support system. As he says right now, he's he's not even a programmer. Uh, he is he is simply being the BDFL of the project and and being kind of the last sign off and, and the last word on everything. He has a lot of different projects. He's been able to intelligently delegate a lot of work and he's I think he's done that very successfully. I mean the ability for the Linux kernel to scale to the extent that it has is is unprecedented there's no other project that big he is he is tread you know in in wilderness that no other devs have even seen yet like he's he's at such big scale that you know and so many different contributors with so many different use cases um and, and i think you know the decisions that he's made uh, has been very it, it, difficult i'm sure right um but the the ones he's been able to delegate are actually i would argue more important because he's created a community right he's used his power to create that community that fosters a good engagement process right and talking about decisions right when you're bdfl you kind of get to set you know the 
the, the policy, right? You get to make the decisions, right? So along with the responsibility comes, you know, one of those perks and says, you know what, guys, we're going to do it my way this time. Sorry, you know, don't don't pull that card too often, but it's good to have that one in your back pocket when you need it. Uh, so one of his policies uh, that I hear him repeating all the time is don't break user space. Right. He's he just made that a policy. He's like, you know what, guys, um, one of the things that I have uh, determined is, you know, we are not going to break user space, period. End of story. Right. And if you try to merge something that does that, I will reject that merge. Sure. Uh, and and that decision has been one of the ones that I think has made the Linux kernel so developer friendly right it's it's very nice to develop against it because legacy stuff does kind of continue to live on and Just, that's another thing too legacy isn't always a bad word right uh, so i i was thinking about this and i was like all right well how would i see this in infrastructure right what if i used if i had like an old server i wanted to decom and i had everything set up on a new server everything brand new everything was was correct technically correct on this new server everything's updated everything's you know ready to go but I had a lot of stuff that was pointing to that old URL that I just didn't have the time to get around and, and update. What would be the impact of like throwing a C name in DNS and just having point to the new server, right? Um, a lot of people would consider that technical debt, right? Uh, but I think something that you and I have talked about, if it's not causing you additional work or, or headache, right? It's not technical debt that needs to be addressed, right? It's right. not debt that you're actively paying off, right? Now, if it's compounding, maybe you want to consider it, but it's not something that's actually making your day-to-day -day or your long-term plans much more difficult, right? You can document that as a fix. You can say, you know what, guys, this decision has been made. This this is just going to live as it is right now. It's documented. It's known. And we're just going to move on from there. There's a lot of different shims. There's a lot of different workarounds. There's a lot of different hacks that people put into their programs. The good kind of hacks, not the bad kind of hacks. You know, then, and they do this just because they're following their own decisions and policy making. And I think as a BDFL, you get to make those for better or for worse. That is your responsibility. And, and that gives you a, a large degree of freedom to make those, those decisions. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a better place to be than having to deal with something that's, that you have no say in. So being, right. being a BDFL is, is always going to be a better place to be in a project than, than not, um, but talking about workarounds, talking about hacky scripts, talking about, you know, putting shims in project, uh, I would say probably the hardest part about jumping into any project isn't necessarily understanding what the project is or where the market fit is or who's who, you know, what the relationships are. I'd, I'd say probably the hardest thing about jumping into a project is just figuring out how to set up a testing environment. Totally. And I've said I, I, I've. I've been slowly thinking about this for like the past couple of months and I've been working on various things, kind of bringing them in and, and, and fiddling with them here and there. And I'm like, why is it so difficult for me to just jump into a new project? Right. It's because the people who've already been there already have their tools set up, already have their environment set up, know the workflow, know the they, they have all of this going on. Right. And figuring out how to just see if the change I made is working. Right. Or or can can I just write a hello world that works somewhere? Right. Sure. How do I do that? And that is 90 percent of the startup time of any different new contributor is saying, how do I set up this testing environment, right? And Linus, being the OG that he is, wrote his own tool set. Now, okay, everyone writes glue code. And, and not just in applications, sure. right? Not just in pipelines and development processes and tooling, but even like in ops and infrastructure, right? You're still going to have all your little shim scripts to copy this one file from over here to over there. Just, you know, just real quick because that needs to happen. 
and it's better than copy pasting it manually you know every sunday night at 3 a.m right when i'd rather have this script be running so everyone writes these little glue code that i i say all these all these little snippets uh now as as a part of the maturation process of of any kind of uh project like that they tend to re- start to, to gather this glue code, you know, they, they scope it out and they try to reduce it down to like a manageable tool or, or some kind of process, right? You, you, you systematize it, right? You make it hopefully modular, right? Hopefully you're able to, to keep it modern uh, and, and you, you make it stable as a result of, of the above, right? You, you, you take everything and you make it part of the process. You make your tooling part of the process so that you you have room to write your little glue code snippets within a larger framework, right? Right. For Linus, that framework was Git. Uh, Git was a a tool. I don't even feel like I have to explain it, but Git is a source control. Uh, 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 SVM, S- SVM. Source control yeah. management. Yeah, source control Ad- management or, or, or you know version management software that. Uh, keeps track of the history of changes to code. And he took like a weekend off or a week off or a month off or something. He was like, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, guys. I'll BRB. And then he comes back with this project that has been adopted by almost every single open source project to date, at least all the new ones. Uh, and and he just kind of released it. He's just like, yeah. I, I got to scratch my own itch uh, and, and I'm just going to toss this out there. And um, it's a tool I'm going to be using going forward to manage the patching and updating and, and making changes to the Linux kernel. Uh, and, and he comes out with this thing that was just miles ahead of anything else on the market, right? Especially for this kind of collaborative, large scale problem that he was having, you know, and, and to your point, yeah, he's not developing it now. He's like, I maintain right. Git for like six months and no more. But still, he's the one who conceptualized it, you know, and 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 birthed it, as you will, and and kind of gave it up into the the broader community, right? And and guys, like, are you kidding me? Not only do you do you create one of the largest projects out there. You also create one of the most popular tools just so that you can manage one of the largest projects out there and and it becomes a success as well. Right. So it it, it just it just blows my mind. It just blows my mind the amount of success that this guy has had. Uh, he, he's just had a couple of really well thought out projects. Right. And, and that's really all it takes. Right. Uh, and and well, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, well, you said it. The one is just quite literally him scratching his own itch. Yeah. I'm sure he had people trying to work on, work on a, uh, was it Minix at the time? Was it, What was it at the time? Yeah, Minix. Was it Minix yep. at the time? Yep. Yeah. And I'm sure he had all these people trying to put stuff in and he's thinking to himself, how is this going to work? How am I going to manage all these changes to these files? And Sure enough, he just went out there, one took a weekend off. It sounds like and f- solved his own problem. Easy enough. Yeah, and and so you know this is that's that's the last part of you know what developers I think are looking to do, right? Um, you know to 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 kind of sum up what we talk about. I mean, they're looking to looking to achieve what I say here: long running purpose that gives them meaning and successful work life balance. Right. That's that's part of being a established player in a large project. Right. Um, you know, being being in a project that they're familiar with and which scratches their own itch, which allows them a degree of authority is also another thing that that people want to be. You know, we're, we're talking about autonomy. Right. Making your own decisions is a core aspect of motivation. Right. There is no other place to be if you want to make your own decisions than to be the BDFL. I'll tell you that. But I don't know if I want to make all those decisions, but backing off of that uh the the last thing you know i think is is core you know and this kind of really speaks to the day-to-day aspect of you know what are you going to do for the rest of your life man right well i think i would rather be using the tools that i prefer and you know I, and 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 the ones that i've crafted or, or tweaked or, or you know tailored to my own needs right 
And and Linus has successfully done that. He's successfully done all three of those things. And I think that, you know, the, the, speaking speaking about large projects, I mean, we're, we're not right now. I, I would love to be someday. Um, and, you know, I might want to write Git as well. Or maybe it's the next, you know, uh, huge DeFi application on, you know, smart BCH or something like that. I, I don't know what's what's up next, right? What's next? Sure. You know, yeah. all I know is that, you know what, I am I'm willing to to take a look at at all the other projects out there, right? I can also step down and say, hey, you know what, you're the BDFL of that project, or you know, you're an established member of that project. I I am so thankful uh that you've taken the time and and dedicated the time and and put in the effort to be a part of this community, to establish and maintain relationships, uh, and and to put in hard work into maintaining the the project that you maintain. And and those are the ideals of open source, right? Those are the collaborative uh, ideas that drive successful open source projects, right? And we're going to be in this journey. We would love you to be in this journey. You know, come and learn, you know, what communities are out there. If if you're really drawn to Dollar Bar, there's tons of people out there whose job it is to talk and troubleshoot and, you know, do cool things with dollar bar maybe it's next cloud maybe it's bitward I don't, I don't know what it is right but if you're looking to be part of that community right and you don't know where to start uh easiest place to go go to arcompose.com right sign up for our newsletter because we're gonna be we're gonna be starting to talk about these things I, I as we have been right we're we're going to be in these communities we're gonna be in these projects we're gonna you know take the temperature of the ecosystem and, and see where it's going and and we would love for you to be on that journey with us. But for now, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.